Good evening. Welcome to Maysville tonight. Good to see everyone out. If you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're here. And if you are visiting, don't mind filling out one of the cards on the backs of the pew in front of you. Pass those towards the center aisles, and we'll have the ushers come down in just a few moments and collect those. And uh, we're grateful for your attendance here tonight. Hope you had a chance to pick up a bulletin, and especially our service team sheet, which is a, a shorter one, which is always uh, nice to see sometimes. Uh, but please make sure you've got uh, those two items. Uh, opening song tonight, number 632. Number 632 be our opening song. A uh, few extra things to add from the bulletin regarding our, our VBS announcement. Uh, next Sunday night will be the kickoff to our VBS. So the agenda for next Sunday night, first of all, I mentioned, if you can fix up a couple of batches of cookies and bring those next Sunday night, we will need tons of cookies uh, to sugar up our kiddos. So if you can do that, uh, please do that. But on the agenda for next Sunday night, that's our kickoff. We're going to have some hot dogs. The hot dogs will be provided, by the way. Uh, after the, the hot dog dinner, we're going to have a family kickball game. I have not had one of those in, in many years. So uh, family kickball. And we do need a head count for everything. So if you can sign up on the sign-up sheet outside the secretary's office, uh, do so immediately so we can get a head count, especially for our food preparation. Uh, but again, that is starting next Sunday night. So please make plans for that. If you've got any questions, you can see Seth or Jill Bowen. I don't think I have any new announcements. Just needed to elaborate on the, the VBS uh, agenda for next Sunday. Uh, please also mention or make note the, the bulletin I mentioned this morning for the, the medications for Honduras. If you can make contributions to that uh, and bring some medications that we need for our trip this year, please do so. And those are listed in the bulletin as a reference. Again, tonight, number uh, 632 be our opening song. Have our closing prayer by Caleb Bowen. And in just a moment, our opening prayer by Greg Richard. Uh, let's open up our Bibles and read from God's Word together. Samuel Bramlett, read to us from God's Word. Uh, today I'll be reading from Philippians chapter 4. If you want to turn there, it's, it's only a few verses. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. Be in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now to thank you for this day that you have given us and the opportunity we have to come here and hear another portion of thy word. Dear Lord, there's many things that we are thankful for, but we're most thankful for your son Jesus who died on the cross to give us a chance to live with you in heaven. Dear Lord, please bless this church and all the members. Please bless all of our activities, especially the uh, coming Honduras trip as we travel and, and try to spread your word down there. Please bless our, our VBS activity coming up next week. Dear Lord, thank you for everything that you do for us. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. I also wanted to make a brief announcement before we started our worship tonight. Uh, elders had a chance to meet with a young man that's been uh, coming to services here um, several several months, actually, I guess, um, and is part of our deaf community, and uh, he wanted to place membership with us, and we met with him and liked you to get to know him better. Brian Sprinkle is his name, Brian Sprinkle, and he's a, I say young man, he's kind of got a little premature graying over here, but he, you know. <laughs> but anyway, um, he, he met with us and uh, liked to, for you to get to know him, and his address will be published later in the bulletin and otherwise and uh, he's been attending uh, been a member of the lord's body a long time but he's been attending west tunstall and and uh, visited with us several times and would like to to engage him working with us so hope you'll make him feel welcome 632 we'll do the first and the last stanzas please <clears throat> of one the lord has made the race through one has come the fall with sin Read. 
291, 291. First and the last stanzas, please. <clears throat> Thirty-two, one thirty-two. We'll do the first and the second stanzas. <clears throat> We'll do the first and the last. <clears throat> Yeah. 
618, 618. I'll <clears throat> we'll do the first and third. <clears throat> Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. And goals be from a world of care. And this be at my Father's throne. May go my wants and wishes. Mark number 29, number 29, and we'll sing that after our lesson tonight. <clears throat> and now 482, 482, we'll do the first and third. If you'd like to, please stand and we'll sing it together. <clears throat> I have always felt that the gathering on Sunday evening has a, a special 
quality to our minds, to our, our hearts and our ways. Often our Sunday mornings are very busy and boisterous. Fridays and Saturdays tend to keep us occupied and we're involved with the things of the world. Oftentimes late nights and much activity fills our weekends. So Sunday morning can be a little, little stressful. But after an afternoon of perhaps easy things and a Sunday evening gathered together, the times when we gather and have an opportunity to share the Word of God, to sing together in praise, to offer our petitions, Sunday evening is a very special time. I am tempted, won't do it, but I'm tempted to uh, put my sermon back in my Bible and preach from the song we just sang, Sweet Hour of Prayer. What a beautiful sentiment is expressed there in the power of God. Lord willing, in a couple of weeks on the 17th of June, I'm going to be somewhere else. I would tell you where, but I don't know where. Libby and I are going to be gone, hopefully, and uh, we're just going that away. So uh, that'll be the case. That'll be Father's Day for many. And uh, I thought I would, since I wasn't going to be here for Father's Day, I thought I'd do my Father's Day lesson tonight. But it's really not, uh, it's not really about fathers. So I'm not sure it's a Father's Day lesson, but it has fathers in the title. I read an article, and uh, the article was about a little, uh, an essay, and I don't know if the teacher had assigned it or if it was uh, just a writing assignment, but a youngster had written an, an, an article entitled, If I Were a Father, and he described the things that, uh, that he would do. He was a young man, not even close to being married, but from the eyes of a child, was able to express certain things that almost certainly were longings that he wished his father would have been or perhaps expressed things that he was. We can do some things hypothetically. If I were, and we can put ourselves into that place and we can evaluate a good bit about our hearts and our our minds, our interests, our goals, our values, we can discover a great deal about us. At first blush, it might seem like the lesson that I've prepared doesn't apply to you. You're going to say, I I'm not a father, I'm not raising children, uh, this doesn't fall into my area of interest, but every one of you in this audience had a father. You might not have known your father. You might not have liked your father. You might not have grown up with, with good experiences around them. But you came from one. And from our God and Father, we have desires. And when we look back and see what God was to His people and what He wanted for them, some of these ideas will certainly find, find voice there. So our lesson tonight, and you'll have to listen to me, I didn't prepare a, a, an overhead for you. If I were a father, and I'll offer you five thoughts in that regard. Number one, if I were a father, I would want my children to have an unshakable faith in God. There are... In the scriptures, many heroes, Old and New Testament. And they're wonderful. I am so grateful for the stories we have about great men and women who lived in difficult times and had a faith, an un, unshakable faith in God. And we could spend the night just talking about them. Daniel, in his time, living under a foreign empire and in a position of great power, who was put at great risk to himself if he followed after God, was certainly going to be killed. He followed after God anyway. 
was thrown into a den of lions which should have taken his life. And the king coming the next morning, hoping that Daniel was alive. Daniel, are you there? Did your God save you? And from the lion's den, Daniel's voice, O oh oh king, live forever. Yes, God saved me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the same stories. These three young men, same situation there in Babylon. Not just men. I think of the women too. Of Hannah, who we meet in 1 Samuel chapters 1 and 2. A woman whose heart was broken because she had no children, but whose, whose faith in God was absolute, and who came before God and prayed, God, give me a son. I'll give him to you. Just let me bear a child. Samuel, the, the great prophet and, and judge, would be the result of that. Or maybe you would think of Abigail, a woman that we're going to find in, in uh, the circle of of King David um, who will play a big role in keeping David from creating some, some very bad circumstances and harm. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 25, he is intent on bringing about the death of uh, a man and, and Abigail, this, this godly woman, comes out and, and saves him. Or Rahab. Joshua chapter 2, a woman who lived in the city of Jericho and, and yet, when the spies came in, she aligns herself with the, the God of heaven and says, I want to be with your God. I, I want to be on your side. Rahab will then become not only in, under the care of Joshua, but she will become part of the genealogy of Jesus. And there's a guy like Samson. <laughs> well... With all the heroes of the Old and New Testament, why do we have a story about Samson? One of the judges of Israel. And, you know, the story of Samson, Judges chapter 14 to 16, you find this guy raised from a Nazarite vow from the beginning that a razor should not come on his hair, on his head, that he would not drink anything or taste anything that came from the, uh, from the vine, so, so no strong drink ever. Samson? This guy was, uh, I don't know what we would describe him today, a skirt chaser. He had some tragic situations in his life. He was an enemy of the Philistines. Um, they, they gave him a wife, but then she was taken away, and, and he gets involved with a woman by the name of Delilah. Now, that's tragic. You think in the description of his involvement with Delilah that Samson doesn't have a brain in his head. How could he, how could he be so twisted by this woman? And yet, there have been many men who have been twisted by women uh, to commit great and tragic harm to themselves and to others. He gives up the secret of his success and finally is taken by the Philistines, has his eyes poked out and is used for sport. How can Samson be a, a mark of, of faithfulness or faith? The last events that unfold in Judges chapter 16 as Samson has been long enough that his hair is regrowing and they brought him in for sport in an assembly where the Philistines have gathered to make fun of him in a, in a very large assembly. And he requests of the young man, just put me against the, the pillars that hold this place up. And with Samson's very last breath, he petitions God. And says, God, give me strength just this one more to avenge just one of my eyes that they have taken out. One thing we're going to say about Samson is that he had a faith that took him all the way to the very last breath. If I were a father, I'd want for my children not only an unshakable faith, but an unquenchable hope. Number two. An unquenchable hope. The brightest light 
is when there is the darkest night. And it doesn't take much of a light. If you've ever been plunged in absolute darkness, in, in total and complete darkness, it doesn't take much. Sometimes there can be an LED on a clock. Have you ever, ever covered up a clock in a, in a hotel room? For, for a little light or something that just is so bright that you had to turn it away or block it in some way? In the daytime, you would never notice it, but at night in the darkness, hope. I am amazed at the Apostle Paul and I am, I am overwhelmed by what he endured in his life. When you really sit down and think about the experiences of Paul, what he went through for the Lord is phenomenal. Of course, we, you remember in Acts chapter 9, even before Saul of Tarsus was preached to by Ananias, that Jesus had told Ananias, I'm going to show Saul what he's going to have to suffer for my name. And he does. He suffers. He never loses hope. As, Saul, or as Paul the Apostle talks about his own experiences, and, and there are so many of them, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 22, if you'd like to follow, I'm going to read several verses. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23 now. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, often. From the Jews, five times. I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. This last phrase in verse 25 always catches me. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. And journeys often in perils of waters and perils of robbers in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? A night and a day in the deep. I can't imagine being out in a ship and having it go out from under me. And I sure can't imagine it being there for a night and a day. When Paul described his own experiences in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and talks about being pressed but not, not broken, perplexed but not in despair, He's describing the fact that although the difficulties of life pressed upon him, they, he, he never lost hope. His hope was not there. If we'd have kept reading in 2 Corinthians 11, you really go all the way down through about half of chapter 12 and you find Paul's, Paul's statement there. He's still talking about his vibrant hope in God, his, his hope for eternal things. Why would anyone put up with all of these experiences in life? And we've seen people fall away uh, for so much less. And Paul is not here explaining why he, he failed, why he quit, why he uh, gave up being a Christian. All of this is done in, with a hopefulness. He's talking about why he's still holding on, why he seeks, seeks and serves God. If I were a father, I'd want my children to have the faith that Samson showed in his death even to the last moment and the hope of the Apostle Paul an unquenchable hope and number three to live in thankfulness thankfulness is a, a trait that is not admired today perhaps it is more common for us to obsess over problems and for us to talk about losses 
those who are involved in life often talk about dreaming of more. They want more from this life, and they're rarely content with what they have. And when they are granted great blessings, there is often no thankfulness there. Perhaps you know the story and perhaps not. I'm not sure to what degree it's been uh, talked about over the uh, broadcast airwaves, but I've been watching this story unfold on the Internet for some time about the, uh, the 30-year-old man who is suing his parents to stay in his house. It's, it's, it's comical. You, you have to read it. Uh, it just takes a certain perspective to come to grips with this guy who thinks it's his right to move back in with his parents and that they should just put up with him forever from that then on. And then you find out the whole story about how they tried to help him get up on his feet and move out. They even gave him money for it to get out, to get an apartment. He spent the money on other stuff because he had needs, you understand. And so finally they drew a line in the sand and decided to have him evicted and, and uh, then he took him to court. He lost. The judge said, get out. This guy has no clue about all of the things that were given to him along the way. He has no thankfulness about all of the blessings that have come into his life through his parents. He feels entitled to more, to bigger, to you take care of me. And people who are not thankful, you cannot fill up that hole. They've got a hole in them. They've got an, an emptiness. You can't shovel enough blessings into the hole of an ungrateful person to make them grateful. If they don't have gratefulness, thankfulness for what comes to them, you cannot give them enough. And in contrast to that, those who are truly, who are truly thankful, even the littlest things... Our blessings. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 17. Starting in verse 11. Luke 17, 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee... And as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. They lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourself to the priests. So it was that as they went, they were cleansed. Watch verse 15. And one of them... When he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus asked the question in the next verse, verse 17. Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine I am certain that God desires of His children that we be more thankful. In fact, Paul would write in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15 and say, Let the peace of God rule your hearts in Christ Jesus and be thankful. Samuel took one of my readings a moment ago, so I won't read that one for you. You got it from the book of Philippians, chapter 4. Paul says, Be anxious for nothing. By everything, with prayer and supplication, make your request known unto God. With thanksgiving, make your request known unto God. Gratitude is such a, such a great blessing. And sometimes we don't, we don't see what is in our lives and we don't see what might have been in our lives. I made reference to Abigail a while ago in uh, 1 Samuel 25. Um, David has a speech that he has at the conclusion of after Abigail has come and, and stopped him from killing uh, 
Nabal and, and Sam, uh, David is going to be the de facto king and this, this, the slaughter of an innocent man uh, would certainly have been a mark against his, his kingship. And he says, you have saved me from bringing harm to myself. You have saved me from bringing vengeance because vengeance belongs to the God. How many things have we been saved from by God? How many things have not happened to us? And of course, we, we'll never know that. You can't know what didn't happen. It's not in my notes. I wasn't planning to talk about it, but at the conclusion of services tonight, I was standing, or this morning, I was standing in the back of the foyer talking with some friends, and the subject of, of motorcycles came up and different things, and they began to talk about, and one of them said, yeah, they'd heard a, read or heard a story, I've forgotten exactly how it was phrased, but uh, a young man had been killed on a motorcycle by a deer. I said, I got some sympathy for that. Things could have been a little different last time I was on the Blue Ridge Parkway. I'm aware of that. How many things are we not aware of, though? How many troubles or problems have not fallen into our laps that God has pr protected us from? And, of course, you say, well, you can't be thankful for what didn't happen to you. I don't know. I'm thankful that I had a parent, my mom and a dad growing up, that took care of me. I'm glad I didn't grow up in an orphanage like some in this room. I was spared that pain. Some have had to say goodbye to their mothers very soon in life. I had mine for many, many years. Had a huge impact in my life. I was spared that pain. Some of you had have tragedies with difficulties of, of, of physical and, and um, family members and financial issues and all kinds of things that have had to been suffered. There are many people in the world who still struggle with so many things. The Pharisee was right who stood before God and prayed, and I'm thankful that I'm not like this publican. Well, we can say, I'm thankful, Father, that you have not laid on me some of the burdens that others have had. How would you like to live Job's life? I'm thankful that I haven't had to deal with many of the problems that so many that I know in my life have had to deal with. So yeah, we can be thankful for what we didn't experience. My wife of 40 years is, is sitting next to me. A friend of mine several years ago lost his wife at the age of 32 to breast cancer. We can be blessed if we learn to live in thankfulness. Number four, if I was a father, I would want my children to, to embody resiliency. Embody resiliency. I'm glad this isn't one of my Bible class notes. I'd have to write that on the board. I'd certainly misspell at least one of those words. Perhaps more than one. Resiliency, now, that's a word we may not use every day. That means you, you don't quit, you don't give up. Uh, when things are adverse, when we face or have adversity, you keep going, you never quit. There are lots of people who find themselves in life and they get to whatever point and they just say, that's it, I quit. I was fortunate to be with my dad last weekend. He is very frail. Um, if he makes it to his birthday this year in October, he will be 92 years old. He is confined to a wheelchair, uh, a powered wheelchair that he's able to move around. Um, but his, his life is very, very limited. He can do almost nothing for himself. And yet he sat at the, uh, at the table with us and, and we played dominoes together and he and my little sister beat my older sister and me soundly 
in a game of dominoes. Just trounced us. He told jokes. He, he, he shared his stories. He has so little strength left. And yet he's still teaching us. At the end, when there's almost nothing left, he is still holding on and he just won't quit. Tyler was married on Sunday or Saturday afternoon and Dad wanted to be there. I told him coming up, I said, Dad, you don't have to come out. We'll come by and see you. We'll make sure that Tyler and Shelby come out. We'll take pictures with you and the kids. Uh-uh, that wasn't good enough. He wanted to be there. It was hot on that afternoon out in Texas. I was thankful for the cloud cover and the, uh, the roof cover above, but nonetheless, it was hot. Dad was there. Sunday morning, he was at Bible class and worship service. Sunday evening, he was at worship service. And I sat and looked out into the audience as I looked down the, the center aisle there in that auditorium, and there sat my dad in the wheelchair. You think I won't remember that? Resiliency. I will not quit. Number five, if I were a father, I'd want my children to hold to the words of God without fail. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, and you can sing it, you know the song that goes with it. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have true sorrow and sympathy for those who do not believe and hold to the Scriptures. They do not know and they do not find comfort in the Word of God. Over my... I was going to say short preaching career. Still short compared to many. I've seen a number of people quit the church. Men who have been elders. Men who have served as, as preachers, song leaders. Women also who had found themselves in some struggle in life or a position where they simply lost touch with God. They were not bound to God's Word. They don't love God. They don't believe the Scriptures. They don't believe the promises. And there are many forces in our world that are, that are pressing upon us and trying to, to make us doubt, to create disbelief in God. It's different than when I grew up. Um, some years ago, probably eight or ten years ago, we had uh, someone in, in our class who had... Uh, been part of our youth group and and uh, often the statement was made to me in a, in a public setting said you're old school okay I got that my uh, my ski jacket that I wore for several years had a, a what do you call it a little patch sewn onto the bottom of it. And uh, I didn't hear it, but Michael Rosenblum told me the story, if I'm remembering right. And um, he, had, uh, he had overheard the guy, one of the young men in the, the, the line, the lift line, who had seen me with my jacket, and he'd, he'd seen that, that little statement, old school, on that patch sewn on my jacket 
And he commented to somebody else. He said, you know, that, old, that guy had, uh, you know, old school written, uh, you know, on that on, on patch. He said, that's okay. He was an old guy. <laughs> Michael shared that with me. I'm not sure if, that was, uh, if there was some hidden meaning there or not. I'm okay with that. I really am. In a, in a modern generation where our youth tend to not be so well connected to scriptures, for someone to say, you're, you're old school talking about the Bible. And I've had that observation made publicly or privately or where it got to my ears in some way. You, st you talk too much about the Bible. You don't tell enough stories or it, it, it's just too... I'll wear that. I'll take old school connected to the scriptures. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Our faith in God is going to be bound up in scripture or it's going to be bound up in nothing. If you do not believe in God because of what you believe in the Bible, then your, your basis for belief is going to be shattered sooner or later. Paul would tell Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3.15, From a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. It's scripture which ties us to God. Friday afternoon, preparing for uh, Tyler and Shelby's wedding, we were at a, a church building that agreed to let us host our reception there, our, our uh, uh, rehearsal dinner for our family uh, in their building. We didn't worship there. We weren't a part of them in any way, except we got to use their facilities there in, in Mount Pleasant. Libby and I were looking through their Bible class uh, um, materials that they had posted on the wall because we had to move up and down the hallway as we moved things. And there was a, there was a board given over to Centurion of Scripture and had names of the little youngsters in that group and their marks placed where they were climbing this mountain. And the Good Samaritan's on the board on the opposite side of the room. And, and here in this building were these things that were devoted to these children and encouraging them to read the Bible. Centurion of Scripture means that you have memorized a hundred verses. And their marks were, you know, they had them by, the, by their name. Some had done 10 and 20 and 30 and 50 and 70. I think there was one youngster who had made it to the 100 mark already. And this is, what, uh, July at the time? I don't know if that was from last year or, or they're starting over. The Scriptures. Jesus asked a question of His disciples. In John 6, the... Uh, the common people are beginning to be troubled by some of the statements of Jesus. He has said things like, uh, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to follow after me, you're going to have to drink my blood and eat my, eat my body. And they were really troubled by that statement. We understand that Jesus was figuratively describing the concept that we would identify as the Lord's Supper. That it would be his sacrifice, and we honor that sacrifice, but they, they were troubled by it. So it says, many of his disciples who walked with him, walked with him no more. They left him. And then Jesus turns to his disciples, John six sixty six, and asks the disciples, will you two go away? And it's Peter who responds. Peter who often had his foot in his mouth. Peter who was often impetuous and uh, impulsive. Peter who... Peter who would write part of the Scriptures. Peter who would say, I want you to be reminded of these things for as long as I live, and I'm going to write them down so that you can have them afterwards. So that you will believe and trust in God. Peter who would say, we have not followed things that were cunningly devised by men, but we are following things and telling you of those things of which we were eyewitnesses. We were there with Jesus. We heard the voice of God speak from heaven. We saw him as he was crucified and were with him in the resurrection. Peter who would make his play and claim to the unswerving faithfulness of God's word. 
Will you two go away? And Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. If I were a father, I would want for my children to have an unshakable faith, to have an unquenchable hope, to live with thankfulness, to embody the very idea of resiliency. And to hold to the scriptures with a grip that would never let go. That's what I would want for my children. With the result that they would be saved in eternity. And you know what? That's what God wants for you. God wants you to have those things. To be steadfast in hope. To be unchanging in your faith. That these things will never let go. To understand the blessings that God gives every day. And to be thankful for them. Jesus would teach his own disciples. That we thank God for even the things that come to us. Thank you for our daily bread. And to hold on to the word of God. So I'll ask you as we conclude this evening, if God wished those things for you tonight, would He be disappointed? Or would that be the description of your life? It may be tonight you need to make a change in your life. It may, may be that publicly you need to ask God for forgiveness. Have the church pray for you. Or come and put on your Lord in baptism. If tonight your relationship with God needs to be changed in a public way, do it now while we stand and sing. appreciate each one visiting tonight if that's the case and I hope you'll come back at a future time. We do have the Lord's Supper still prepared this evening. If you'd like to partake of it, anyone, feel free to go to the foyer at this time. You'll be served or shown where you can be served anyway. <clears throat> um, number 303, we'll use the first stanza of this as our closing song tonight, 303, and then, then be dismissed in prayer. <clears throat> Oh, my cross may be hard to bear.
Let's pray. God, we're so thankful for another day, another start of the week, to be able to come here with Christians, bro Christian brothers and sisters and to worship and sing praises to you. God, we're so thankful for you, the greatest Father of all, and we're so thankful for the love that you show us, that we're so undeserving of, and even when we're hard to love, God, you, you love us unconditionally. We're so thankful for your patience and your mercy, and some days it seems that we just sin time and time again, but you're always willing to forgive us, Lord. We know that you'll never give up on us. We pray that we may never give up on ourselves, Lord, that we may always continue to fight the good fight until we meet you in heaven one day. And please be with us as we go throughout this week. Help us be a reflection of the love that you show us. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.